Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian Krieger. Brian is a data science and machine learning expert at CH Robinson. Uh, he's an energetic and innovative mathematician with a broad experience in data science, statistical modeling, data mining, and solving complex business problems. Uh, his specialties include data engineering, data mining, statistical modeling, machine learning, data analysis, and mathematical modeling. He's also the co-organizer for Twin Cities R user group, Pi Mintos, the Twin Cities uh, Python user group, one of the original members of Mini Analytics, so member number, what, two maybe? Two, yeah. Something like that. Long time supporter. Uh, and he will be sharing with us a talk on uh, using uh, open source Python to import and clean data, develop visualizations to further understand it, and tackle the problem. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you, Sean. I'm Brian Krieger. Like uh, Sean said, I work at CH Robinson. I'm on a data science team where we build applications to take data closer and closer to the people who need it. And currently, we're working with our uh, our sales team in order to get them up to the minute pricing information, up to the minute uh, uh, lead generation types of things like that. So Python is a really important tool in our data science stack. And uh, I've uh, long been a user of Python, but really pushing it out now. Um, just a, a quick show of hands. How many people have experience with Python? Wow. All right. Thanks, everybody. No, I'm sorry. Um, how many people uh, are? SAS? OK. Um, today, what we're going to talk a little bit about is just getting started with your data. So we're going to talk about the front end of the uh, data science workflow. And uh, of course, this is a data science talk. So you're either going to see Drew Conway's Venn diagram or some slide with a workflow on it. So um, again, this is just a little bit about me. Um, actually, uh, unfortunately, uh, yesterday, that uh, now becomes father of two dogs, two cats, and two humans. So um, had to say goodbye. Uh, Yesterday, I'm sorry, the picture up in the corner is one of me at, uh, this is a totally unsolicited uh, plug. If you haven't been to the Science Museum of Minnesota to see the science of Pixar, it is well worth it. Absolutely well worth it. Uh, going this, that was actually a uh, um, uh, concept art for anger from the uh, Inside Out uh, production. So. Uh, Python. Python was conceived in the late 1980s, uh, started being implemented by Guido Van Rossum. Uh, Python 3, the, the big controversy was Python 3 was released in 2008, and they made the conscious uh, effort to break backwards compatibility. Now, when you usually get a, an upgrade, you don't break things that are in the past. The conscious effort was done that, and the, the idea was to basically get newer, better ways of doing things rather than do that. And there, if you walk into a company that is existing, uh, excuse me, using Python currently, you have to make sure that you've got the right version because there are some things that won't work. Um, and again, that's more of a, an ecosystem type of thing. The current version that was just released is 3.60. Uh, another shameless plug, if you are new to Python and you want to experiment, See the people at Anaconda. They have a fantastic distribution. Very easy to install. Very easy to get going and, and uh, using it. It will have everything that you need in terms of data analysis. In terms of uh, you know again Jupyter notebooks, things like that. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some data. Um, we did a, a tutorial yesterday on this, about two and a half hours. We're going to look at a couple of the same problems that we did uh, yesterday, but. Again, you've got data, you're bringing it in, you want to do some an uh, uh, analysis around that. So um, how many people here are baseball fans? How many people know enough baseball to talk about it? All right, that's better. So um, I am, uh, uh, I don't know if I want to say I'm a passionate fan, but I am a fan. I, I love the Laman uh, baseball data set. It's rich. Um, it's not to sound condescending. It's a fantastic opportunity to look at a relational structure, but do it in uh, with either R or Python. Um, lots of things, lots of keys, being able to join and, and analyze things. Uh, a passion project of mine that I've been working on for about five years and and going nowhere with is trying to predict baseball's most valuable player using just statistics. Um, now, those of you who are familiar with it, you you know it's voted on by baseball journalists, and you know what the hell do they know? So um, it's also voted on right after the uh, completion of the season, but before the playoffs. So 
um, you know, again, it, they don't really take into account uh, statistics. They also are pretty geographically minded. So a beat writer in New York is not really going to care about mid middle America markets and things like that. So, but our data today, historical data from 1871 through 2016, um, you can actually get this data uh, set as CSV files, which are, everybody loves uh, CSV files, um, an SQL database, or a <coughs> Microsoft Access database. So um, they're available on all of those. Uh, you know, we've got player data. We're going to look at some of the player data, pitching, hielding, uh, excuse me, pitching, hitting, and fielding, um, awards data, most valuable player, rookie of the year, um, those of you who are a little older can remember things like Fireman of the Year, given to in the late 70s, early 80s to relievers. Um, and then also Gold Glove, things like that. And then team data, you know, again, win-loss records, attendance, uh, aggregated batting and fielding information, and then also coaching data. And we're not really going to get into coaching data too much. Um, I, I've explored it a little bit in my uh, horrible effort to try and predict the most valuable player. So, <clears throat> so Python tools. Really, to start a data analysis project, you have to be able to work with the data. And you know, working with the data gives you a better understanding of what that data is. Um, the SciPy stack is uh, NumPy, which allows us to look at tabular data, um, create uh, matrices and arrays. And again, this was uh, NumPy was written by Travis Oliphant, who is uh, currently at uh, Continuum Analytics. Um, he wrote a book on uh, NumPy. Uh, Again, when you think about statistics, when you think about machine learning algorithms, most things are matrices. So that's uh, NumPy is under the hood of, of Pandas, which is the next one. And we're going to talk a lot about Pandas today, also about Matplotlib, which is a visualization tool. And then IPython. And IPython is what's under the hood for our Jupyter Notebooks. Okay? So Scikit-Learn is a machine learning uh, package that you can get. It's got a lot of up-to-date uh, modern machine learning algorithms in there, uh, linear regression support vector machines, uh, neural nets. Uh, you can actually go, if you want to go to deep learning, there's uh, Keras and TensorFlow uh, libraries for, for Python. And then the last one we're going to look at is stats models. And stats models really doesn't get enough press. It's uh, actually a really impressive uh, package. We're going to do a little bit of, uh, with that today. But also, we're just going to use Jupyter Notebooks. OK. So as promised, here's your data science uh, workflow slide. You can see that we re acquire the data, reformat the data. One thing that's really nice about Python, and one thing we do an awful lot at uh, CH Robinson, is we hit our transactional database, which is SQL. It's a Microsoft SQL server, so we use PyMS SQL uh, package to do that. You basically can write your query. It, it passes through, brings the data back as a pandas data frame. All right. Downside to that, where do pandas data frames live? in memory on your computer, right? So you can't go through, pull back, expect to pull back a 10 billion row table and put it into your memory. Um, that's both R and Python have that, have that uh, consideration. You know, you can only do so much as your computer will allow you to do. So again, acquiring the data, reformatting and cleaning the data, that is a iterative process. You're not going to be one and done with that. So you're going to need to do that over and over again. And then this one, I li actually like this one. This is Philip Guo from, uh, I think he was at Google at the time. Um, it's already four years old, but again, I like the iterative nature of it because data science is messing with your data, beating the crap out of your data over and over again until you get what you need to. And again, uh, uh, one of the talks that today, later today is Rob Cooley from uh, Optimine. He's going to be talking about what to do if you don't have the data that you need and how do you rethink your problem. So that's, that's going to be at 12.30. Um, so tools for our investigation. Um, I apologize for the, we'll, we'll show an example of this here. But uh, these are pandas functions. Info. Info is going to give us a, a quick look at what our data is like. It's going to list all of our columns. It's going to list what the data types are. All right. But sim very similar to STR and R or proc contents and SAS. All right. Describe is, again, much like R summary. It's going to take every numerical variable we have, give us a five number summary, mean, and median, which, again, is part of the five number summary. So calm down. Um, then head and tail are, are very similar. It's going to give us either the top rows or the bottom rows. And we'll, we'll you know, again, we've got a live demo here, so we'll uh, um, look at that. So questions for today. Really, you can't start data science without wanting to have a question. Uh, what is attendance going to look like for this year that's going on right now? We have attendance for last year. We want to look at what the t attendance trends have been looking like and maybe make a, a very, well, and as it turns out, really terrible prediction. 
Um, okay, what team has won the most series, World Series? Does anybody have an idea? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, the New York Yankees. What player has won the most valuable most player awards? Uh, unfortunately, again, Barry Bonds, but that's okay. Um, and then, what is the most teams that one player has played for in one year? Now, we know players can be traded uh, mid-season or at any point in the season, so how, what is the m most number of teams that somebody has played for? Now, back in the, before the 20s, right before World War I, Baseball players were treated like commodities. In fact, there's a story that I've never been able to actually find evidence for, but one player was traded for some sugar and flour because the owner of the team needed sugar and flour for his bakery. So, um, you know, it's, it's when you talk about trades and things today and, and equity. So, uh, and then finally, I don't think we'll have time to get to how many home runs will be hit in 2017, but it'll be very similar to the, uh, the attendance. Yep, there's my last slide. So, let's go ahead and go to a Jupyter notebook here. How's that for everybody? Can everybody see that? I will put these, uh, I'll put this notebook and I'll wrap it into the presentation and give it to the mini analytics uh, people so they can post it together. I may also take this and cut this out and, and put it as an appendix to the slides. So either way you can, you'll have this code. So, um, first thing we need to do, again, Jupyter Notebook um, as a, uh, the speaker from Anaconda, these are revolutionizing how we're doing business because now we can actually pass a workflow and work notes uh, along with a project to a business partner. At CH Robinson, we do a lot of dockerization, so we don't need to worry about environment. So that if I handed you off a, uh, I would tell you where to go for, with the address in the notebook, you wouldn't have to worry about what version of Python, you wouldn't have to worry about R, you wouldn't have to worry about environmental variables. Really big, it's not a virtual machine, all right, so it's not gonna, you're not gonna have to spin up something, but it is really, really, uh, rather nice. So, first thing we need to do in order to get our uh, uh, data analysis going is in, import our functions. We're gonna import NumPy, we're gonna import pandas, and then we're also gonna import one uh, function from matplotlib, which is pyplot, because we're gonna look at attendance, and we need, first thing we need to do is go to the, the right table that has attendance, roll it up into the year, because we have 20 teams, each of their attendance is uh, you know, presented at, at the team level, roll it up, and then uh, summarize it. So the, the second step is, is load our data. Now we said we had 28 tables in uh, the Laman database. We certainly don't need them all. We have awards, we have coaching awards. We actually have uh, batting separated out by regular season versus postseason. So if you wanna look at that, you certainly can. But these are the four tables that we're gonna look at today. Um, the batting table, which has 102,000 rows. Um, the teams table, again, which has the, the information for the team, win-loss record, whether they won their division, whether they won the World Series, and then the awards, and then also master, which is the demographics of the, um, of the, of the players, where they were born, you know, what year they were doing. So if we wanted to ask questions like the average age of an award winner, rookie of the year, most valuable player, gold glove winner, we can actually calculate that. All right, so. Easy enough to uh, run this. <clears throat> and uh, one of the downsides to Jupyter is that um, it really doesn't tell you if you've done something right. You know, if you're in desperate need of affirmation or something like that, it's not gonna give you a participation trophy. But it will tell you certainly when you've done something wrong. So uh, we didn't get any errors, so that means that we've done anything. We also haven't asked Python to show me any of the tables. So those tables are now uh, loaded into the memory on my cute little MacBook here. So um, let's, let's go ahead and use those uh, functions we talked about earlier. So I'm just gonna insert a cell right here and run through those. Let's look at batting.info. All right, and we'll execute that. And very similar to what we had, again, in structure, you can see that it tells us that uh, the class is a uh, pandas core data frame. The range index, there's 102,000 rows, almost 103,000 rows. Um, the next number there is the index number. Python takes great advantage of indices. It helps speed things up. Um, when you get a little more uh, acclimated with Python, you can start merging and uh, doing data analysis, subsetting, filtering on indices. It's extremely uh, 
powerful way to, to do business. Then we've got the columns, and you can see the player ID is an object. That basically because Python's not sure whether it's going to be a string or a, numer uh, a number. So it's basically going to say, you know what? I don't have this thing. It's just an object. But it, it will tell you that your ID is an integer. And I'm not really too sure, and I haven't really dug under the hood. But if you go down to RBIs, it actually casts RBIs as a float. Now, anybody who knows baseball knows we don't have half RBIs. We, these are integers. And it's, I, again, I'm not sure why exactly Python read the first handful of lines and came back and said, well, you know what? I don't have any whole numbers, but I'm going to call it a, a, I'm sorry, I don't have any partial numbers, but I'm going to call it a float anyways. So um, all of the numbers in this table are integers. Okay, we haven't calculated batting averages, we haven't calculated on base percentage or anything like that that we would look at. So again, this is the info. Now the really nice thing about this is when we're building processes that are gonna put it, be put into production, we need to take care of things like memory. And it's gonna tell me how much memory this table is gonna take up at the very bottom there. Right now it's taking up 17 megabytes of my internal memory. If I am in a system that's taxed, and I don't have production processes uh, that have unlimited memory to do that, we have to watch things like that. So maybe we'll strip out column, only the columns that we need or something like that. That's something that we'll, we'll think about in our workflow. But right now we're just answering some very sil simple questions about my data. All right. <clears throat> Before I go on, questions about that? Go ahead and raise your hand. We can. Am I going too slow, too fast? OK. So let's look at describe. Okay, and you'll notice here that um, we've got each of the numerical values there, and it's actually off the screen because we have a whole lot more than that. But you can see that in your ID, it gives us a count that tells us how many rows in our table have a year ID, right? And it's all 102,816 of them. It gives us a mean. Now, your ID is actually more of a factor or a, a label, right? We're not actually gonna do any uh, calculations on it, so we would necessarily, um, having the, uh, the mean and the standard deviation is kind of nice, but again, it's not really that big. But if you look at, again, the, the things that we should look at is the mean and the max. That's 1871 and 2016. That tells me that I've got all my data in there, right? And that's how I can tell what the, the minimum value and the maximum value of this, that column is. Now, stint. Stint is actually what we're going to be looking at in a little bit because that's going to tell me how many teams the player played within the year, all right? You can see here that um, by looking at the uh, distribution there, at the 75th percentile, the stint was one. That means that 75% of the players only played for one team throughout that entire database for a year. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they played the entire year. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know, they were even good. All right? But it just says that, hey, you know what? They played at least one game, whatever Major League Baseball says, you, know, you qualify for a game. I think you actually have to be in for an out is, what I, uh, is how I think how you, you get credit for that. So, but the maximum stints, that answers our first question. All right, we had players in our database that have played for five teams in the span of a year. All right, and actually what's kind of interesting is that these were in the 1910s when there weren't 162 games. So we'll look at that here in a little bit. And then games, you can see the games are the games played. So you can see that the average mean, or the mean number of games that are in the entire database is 51. Now today there's 162 games that are played. So again, this also goes back to 1871. This doesn't really help us because it's not telling us the maximum number of games per season. Uh, you know, there was only about 80 games with, uh, a season in the early 1900s and then it went up to 100 and then it went up to 150 and then it went up to 162. So, you know, again, that's something we might want to uh, uh, take a look at. Now, remember I said that this batting table is regular season, it's not postseason. Interesting how somebody can actually get into 165 games when there's 162 max. 163 if we have special situations like we did a couple years ago when the Twins and the White Sox were tied and you have to have a playoff. That's considered regular season. But um, 165, that's something that I, I kind of found interesting. And then you can also see somebody actually got to play and batted 716 times during the year. That's an awful lot. <laughs> so. All right, so describe gives us 
only numerical columns. And that's a little different than the summary function in R, which will actually give you counts and uh, things like that. So describe does that. I, I will not go ahead and go through head and tail uh, for this because we need to, how we're doing for time? We're good? All right, so let's talk about attendance here. Attendance is in the team tables, all right? And what we're gonna do is for our analysis here, we're gonna restrict it to 1990 and um, current. So we're gonna pull back 17 years, 1990 to 2016. <coughs> and also, I don't really need all of the uh, rows of the attendance table, so I'm just gonna pull back my year ID and my attendance, all right? So the first row there, right there, is, is uh, how I filter my data, right? I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna pull back uh, year IDs greater than 1990, all right? The second row there is a very powerful pandas function called group by, and that lets me aggregate. Now, I didn't ask who has SQL experience here, um, but again, if you're actually aggregating in SQL, the group by is really what you, you do, all right? So basically what we're gonna do here is we're gonna group by year ID. So when I run this, I wanna bring it back and have a, um, an, a, a, a sum of attendance by year. Now the second, or the, excuse me, the third row there where I reset the index, um, under the hood, we're looking at aggregating different things across different indices, and Python doesn't get confused, but we really don't care. So what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna say, well, you know what, I have a new data frame, I'm gonna re-index it, all right, and it's not really gonna be that important to me. It also, in Jupyter Notebooks, makes things look a lot better, all right? And then finally, um, we're gonna bring back that data frame to see what it looks like. Is that, can everybody still see that? I, I shrunk it a little bit. Okay, so you can see right now that we've got, um, by year, we have the attendance. Okay, now this is across Major League Baseball. This is American League and National League. We're gonna take a second here in a minute and look at the split between American League and National League. But what we wanna do here is, I wanna visualize this to see if I can immediately vi uh, see any types of trends. So, we'll come to the next cell here, and we'll basically, um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the PLT function, remember, is the pi plot from, that we brought in from matplotlib. I put a title on there. Um, I'm labeling my uh, x axes, my y axes, and then basically what I need to do is feed in two lists. Two lists of numbers where that's gonna, that are going to be plotted my x numbers and my y numbers. All right, and um, one thing that's kind of fun with uh, this pl plot function is we're gonna, I, I hope it resolves here for you, but basically we're gonna use a, a circle and we're gonna make the circle blue and the edge color red. So it should be a circle with a red boundary and a blue face. <clears throat> now, in Jupyter Notebook, I can actually create the object, the, the plot, but I'm not gonna show it unless I tell Python to show it to me. All right, so that's what that PLT show says. Okay, so you can see that it's really an interesting kind of trend. All right, um, very hard to see liberal, excuse me, uh, a linear trend there. Maybe you want to try a, a, some type of polynomial to see what it looks like, but it seems like, you know, after 2005, 2006, things kind of leveled off. Price increases, market uh, forces, things like that we can, we can talk about. Okay, but really no, no trend other than up from the 1990s and then it seems to have uh, tapered off, and that should tell you right now that when we run our linear regression on it, we're really gonna get some terrible numbers. So, um, we can actually go ahead and change the color of our things there uh, with the R. We'll, we'll, we'll see this in the very next one. Um, red, blue, green, C is for cyan, M is for magenta, Y is yellow, white, uh, excuse me, W is white, and then K is black. So, um, and then we can also make our, what our, we can change our markers. So let's, let's go ahead and split it out by league and see if there's anything that we can notice in uh, between the American League and the National League. So again, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna run the same process except I'm gonna add a layer of uh, aggregation there where I put my year in and then I put my 
uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, my year ID and then my league ID. So I'm gonna, for each row now, I'm actually gonna have a 34 row uh, table where I'm gonna have a year, a league, and then the attendance numbers. And then I'm gonna uh, group by the year ID and the league ID, and I'm gonna sum it, and then reset the index. <clears throat> And you can get you can see the output of that table. All right. Now, in order for me to do the plots, I need to actually identify them by league. All right. So basically, all I'm doing here is I'm going to slice out uh, the National League into one table, the American League into another. Okay. Um, this last one here is I'm sorry. This next cell. Excuse me is uh, the very first line is the PyLab in line. That's what's called a Python magic, and it's part of a Jupyter Notebook, and basically what that allows me to do is bring in functionality from a, from a library without actually having to import the library. And all I really want to do is I'm bringing in the RC parameters, which is going to help me make my graph a little bigger. If I want to make it smaller, I can make it smaller too, but I'm gonna, that's going to help me adjust the size of the graph. Okay, so again, we're going to graph both of the American League and the National League attendance on the same graph to be able to take a look at them. Um, all we need to do is use the, the plot function for these, and you can see that I've got the American League in one row and the American, uh, National League in the other row. I'm going to change the color, line style. I'm not actually going to uh, use a line between the points to get that. I'm just going to look at that. And then finally, we're going to use the same uh, markers. We're not going to make them uh, different colored. <clears throat> Make sure you close your parentheses. Okay, what did I do wrong? Okay, so we said that National League was in blue and American League was in red. So you can see in the early 1990s, the American League was a whole lot more popular than the National League, and I apologize for not having 4K up there for you, but, um, but after 1996, 97, the National League just split just went crazy, and the American League has a nice trend to it. Now, we're not going to be able to do a good prediction on the uh, National League, but the really interesting thing is that it really took off. All right? So we saw the aggregate, but then here is, you can see that the American League's been fairly consistent, a slight upward trend in the, uh, um, uh, in the attendance, but not like the National League. This, the National League in the late 90s just surpassed and, and took after the, uh, the American League. So. Python allows us to look at the same trend lines or the same uh, behavior uh, on the same graph. And we could actually add a few more things in here if we wanted to about that because, again, we can put as many things with, ju with just a simple plot statement on the same graph. Okay? There's a Python library that we use an awful lot of at CH Robinson called Plotly, which allows us to do interactive graphs so that you can actually put widgets in to basically look at um, you know, resolution around points. We can actually highlight points to, to see what's going on, especially if they're in... Uh, uh, specific different types of dimensions of space. So uh, again, that's a, a really powerful tool. Okay, so um, the next step we're going to do again is we're going to uh, use stats models to do uh, a really very simple regression. All right, and we're going to basically uh, do two things here. We're going to look at the parameters, and again, I'm going to tell you ahead of time this is a terrible model. All right. Um, but we're going to look at the parameters, we're going to look at the summary statistics from this, and then we're going to append it and to the table. So the, the top there is going to basically run the model for us, and we're going to get the model, and it's going to be stored in an object called result. So then we're going to basically pull out and print the result, the part of the, uh, the object that is the parameters, which is going to give us the coefficients, and then the summary is going to give us a whole lot of statistics, and then finally, um, the attendance year, we're going to basically add a, a column to the attendance by year call, uh, data frame and we're going to put the resid uh, we're going to call the fitted values from the result object and just append that
Okay. Okay, so again, really a horrible model if you look at the R squared, which of course everybody knows not to march right to the R squared. But looking at the R squared, we can see that I was, you know, not really all that great. But, you know, the intercept is actually a negative 15 billion. And the year ID, actually, the, the, the coefficient of that is on the order of, you know, 800,000. So, really not that great of a, a, an interpretable model. But you can see here, this is actually what comes out of the stats model uh, regression. It helps us understand a little bit more. Uh, you don't get this type of information out of the scikit-learn uh, regression package. So stat, I, I tend to, if I'm going to do something like this, go to stats models because it helps understand, it helps, you know, kind of drill down there. Now, if you look at the warning, the second warning, the condition number, condition number is a property of the matrices that feed into the um, regression uh, process. Remember, everything is in statistics is a matrix. Big condition numbers are really bad because basically what that does is that when we calculate the inverse, we take the inver uh, one over the condition number, and that makes everything, the bigger the condition number, the smaller that number, and that means that our matrices tend to be non-singular or uninvertible, okay? So that's why that warning is up there. Um, basically it says there's a strong multi collinearity. It tends to, when people see big condition numbers or inverted matrices, excuse me, non-invertible matrices, they tend to think co multicollinearity in the, in the columns or the rows. I'm sorry, in the columns. So that's one thing, and, and turns out that's not necessarily the case. We can have sparse matrices and things like that. And then other numerical problems, and uh, we, we kind of just mentioned that. Okay, so then finally, in that, the last step of this one was we just appended the uh, fitted value to the attendance, and we can see that, um, you know, we have good, good fits, or I'm sorry, good fits and bad fits. All right, so let's, um, okay, so the next thing we'll look at is um, the teams with the most World Series wins. So we're gonna go back to the team's uh, data frame. And if you look at the top line here, this is actually a if-then logic. Now in the team's data frame, we have a World Series win as a yes or a no, a Y or an N. And what I wanna do is convert that to binary that allows me to look at the team's table and say, American League or National League, who's won, historically who's won more, because I can take a mean and, and compare means to see that. So uh, we need to use NumPy where function for this, and again, this is very straightforward if then logic, like you would do an R or uh, SAS. What is my uh, condition? Again, is the, in the team's column WS win, is that, if that's a Y, I wanna give it a one, if it's not, I wanna give it a zero. All right, now, one thing I haven't done here is to see if I have missing values. So uh, note to self, make sure that we check that in the future. But um, what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to uh, use that binary, just do a quick group by on the team ID and then sum it, redo it, and then uh, sort it, and it'll bring it back uh, and it'll show me. And I need to uh, call that data frame. So. Okay, so um, one interesting to point out here, uh, it's an unfortunate fact that the New York Yankees have won the most World Series. And my apologies to Yankees fans, but uh, uh, do we actually have any Yankees fans in the room? My apologies to you, sir. So, <laughs> so well, actually it turns out the Yankees have been around the longest team of any, uh, in baseball, so it figures that they get lucky now and then. So uh, again, my apologies. I, so, but uh, St. Louis National, again, we could dive a little bit deeper into the, uh, into the uh, dimension table. But look in uh, the third row there, uh, New York won. One thing that the team's table has is a history of the franchise. Now, does anybody know what the first team that actually played in Milwaukee was? It was the Braves, right? It was not the Brewers that are there now, right? So, we can actually go back and track the lineage, which makes it a whole lot of fun when we talk about the California Angels right now, who are the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. 
and you know they went through the Anaheim Angels, they went through the California Angels. So again, we, if, we, if we wanted to do this historically and roll it up into one entity, we would have to use that table to track the franchise. And the franchise ID is actually the key for that one, and that's part of the, the table here. But again, very straightforward. Um, I just went to the teams table, I grabbed the team ID, I created a, this binary variable, and then I uh, aggregated up on the group by, did the sum, because again, it's a binary, so the sum is just gonna give me the count of the, if they won, and then sorted it. And again, sorting, uh, the, the call is sort values. Sort still works, but it's deprecated, you'll get a, um, uh, error message. Actually, I'm sorry, warning. It, it says it's deprecated in, uh, in favor of sort values. So um, the next question we want to know is how many players, I'm sorry, how many teams has one player played for the entire, uh, their career, I'm sorry, for one year? So we'll, let's look at this next one here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use value counts, which is a shortcut to basically just count the values of a, uh, of a, a factor or a categorical variable. Now, again, we saw stint was actually an integer, but we're gonna use it as a, as a categorical variable here. So I'm gonna go to the batting uh, data frame. I'm gonna use the stint column. You saw we had a couple of different ways of slicing that and uh, calling that variable. Um, this is kind of an SQL alias kind of way. So that first line basically says, let's count the stint and then let's uh, uh, bring back the, um, The, one, uh, the players, excuse me, that had more than five, uh, I'm sorry, five uh, stints. So you can see here that it basically gave us an ordered list of that, that categorical variable. You can see that you know, 95,000 or the overwhelming majority of the 103,000 row table only had one stint. We kind of expected that from the describe function because the 75th percentile was one, okay? And then you can see that we had actually four players I'm sorry, 24 players played with four teams during the year. And in fact, one of them uh, that we discovered yesterday in the tutorial was as more recent as 2014, which I would have kind of thought was a little odd because in modern baseball, people don't tend to uh, look at um, hand-me-downs. So let's, uh, uh, hand-me-downs, I'm sorry, professional athletes, excuse me. So, um, so the last thing we did was we went to the batting table. We, we said, all right, the maximum stint was five. Let's pull out those, those players that had five. We know it was two. And we can see that one was 1904, one was 1914, uh, the very first Washington team. And um, FL was the, I believe, the Federation League. So, um, and the BRF. So you can, again, one thing to point out here is if you look at the middle of the table, you had an ellipsis. Again, there are 48 columns in this table, and it's not going to bring back all 48 for you. Now, that's, one that, that's a difference between the Jupyter Notebook and the R Studio uh, data frame. You can actually go through each one of those. So um, that's that case right there. So let's go ahead and let's look at this poor SAP in 19, excuse me, highly trained professional athlete in 1914 and see what his uh, statistics look like. So we're going to go to the master table. We'll actually bring them back both. And we see that one was Felix, um, probably going to missay that, Chenard, and then Frank Hilsman. And you can see their debuts were 1910 and 1897. So Frank was, been, was around quite a while before he was uh, uh, shipped from place to place. So um, let's go ahead and do one more thing here, and then I'll wrap up, and we'll take some questions. And here is uh, Frank, I'm sorry, this is uh, Felix Chenard's uh, information. You can see in 1914 he played uh, for those teams, those five right there. He actually only played basically three years in, in, the, in the leagues. 
So um, just to wrap up here, again, Python is an incredibly f powerful language. One thing we leverage it for at CH Robinson is it, it helps us integrate into production processes. IT is a little more open to um, Python than R. Um, R requires a, a different, uh, different uh, infrastructure to support. So Python tends to, uh, tends to ease that, uh, that integration factor. Um, there are a lot of really good, powerful things that you can do with Python. Um, so, all right, have a good day.